Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. Isn't this exciting? Yes. Get to do something a little different for uh, Christmas Eve. I, I've never had a three o'clock service before. I have done family services, usually later in the day, but a three o'clock just seemed to fit together really well. And for some of you, this is the first time you've been in the sanctuary in months. And so we are so glad. We changed it around, you notice a little. No, we really didn't. But if we had, you would notice it. You'd be the ones to notice it. Um, but we're just excited that you could uh, be here with us this afternoon. And we'll, for whatever plans you have for the rest of the evening and tomorrow, we just pray that God blesses you in that. And that the sense of joy that is all of ours at this time of year is just rests with you wherever you go and whatever you do. So thank you for coming. Just a couple of, uh, of announcements. First of all, thank you for wearing your masks. I'm far enough, but I can't breathe. By, anyway, but, but thank you for, for doing that. Also, um, there will be, uh, there's no offering that is collected, but there are offering plates for year and giving at the doors, so make use of those if you will. And um, let me see, if you don't like this service, you can come back at 7 o'clock, <laughs> where you will get exactly the same one. Huh? Six o'clock. Yeah, come at 7 and you will miss that one. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, but of course, we will have worship service at 10 o'clock on Sunday and uh, continue the, uh, the joy of Christmas with that. So isn't this all exciting to do so? I feel like the family of God finally gets together uh, when we do Christmas Eve services. And so this is a great blessing. So with that in mind, uh, let's uh, begin our time of worship. Tim, thank you for being here. Throughout the entire Christmas season, Tim has led us in uh, his ministry of music uh, so many wonderful, wonderful ways. And Tim, thank you so much.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The shepherds listened to the songs of angels. Follow the stars. But the glory of God shines in a manger. Go, tell it on the mountains, over the hills, and everywhere. Our scripture reading is John 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Join me in unison. O oh God, grant that this season the Christ of Bethlehem may be born not only in our memories, but anew in our hearts. May the star that first pointed the way be the light that will lead us out of darkness. Amen. Our second scripture reading is Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus 
issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. Which, which were just as they had been told. Let us turn to God for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. So a little fellow was told about his new baby sister, and when he was told, he wasn't particularly impressed. He went to school the next day, and the teacher remarked, I hear you have a new member in your family. Oh, yeah, he said. The teacher said, well, what's the matter? Aren't you happy to have a new little sister? The little boy said, well, I guess so, but there were a lot of other things we needed more. <laughs> Now, I know that for many people who hear the Christmas story, perhaps for the first time, their initial reaction might be that what the world needs the most is not another baby. I mean, it's very wrong, but that may be how they feel. Someone has said that when God wants something to happen in this world, something done, he has a baby born. You know that was true of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. The prophets had spoken of old, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. We've gathered tonight to acknowledge the fulfillment of that prophecy. The Messiah was born to Mary and Joseph in that little town of Bethlehem. It was a stable where he was born, which is a strange place for a king to be born. The king of kings in particular. I mean, it was a plain, shabby place for the birth of a Messiah. I was reading somewhere back about a South African diamond miner who found one of the world's largest diamonds. It was the size of a small lemon. And the, the miner needed to get this to the home office. It was incredibly valuable. And so they made a, a metal box, and they had armed guards who went with the box, never left its side all the way from South Africa to London. And when they got to London, they opened the box, and there was a piece of coal in it. And two days later, the diamond arrived in the mail. 
Yeah, but you see, it, it's brilliant, isn't it? Because nobody was expecting it. Nobody was waiting for that. They were expecting something great, something grand, something, well, not plain and shabby. Well, something like that took place that very first Christmas. Who would think to look in a stable for the incarnated God? Only a few star-struck shepherds took note of what happened on that ti- in that tiny little town of Bethlehem. Why should the world take note? As far as we know, no one else heard the angels. No one else saw the star. The rest of the world just saw a plain cardboard box like that diamond was in. Who? They could not know that that box contained the advent love of God in a world torn by strife. Now, Joseph knew. The angel had appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Mary knew. And in in her amazement and at the adaptation of the song, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his handmaiden. No wonder that the Blessed Virgin has captured the imagination of countless people around the world. There's an old story about a skeptic who was meeting the local priest, greeted him and, and said this, Hello, Father. Hey, tell me this. What's the difference between Christ's mother and my mother? priest says, I don't know, but there's plenty of difference between their sons. <laughs> See, Mary is venerated by millions of Christians because of the uniqueness of her son. She knew that within the plain brown wrappings of a stable and a manger and shepherds and lowing cattle and all of that, that the world had forever been changed. Because you see, the world is a beautiful place when love comes into it. There's a, an anthem, Babs, you know this, this anthem, Love Came Down, remember? Love came down at Christmas, love so lovely, so divine. Love came down at Christmas, star and angel gave the sign. So what about this love? I mean, love came down at Christmas. It's a wonderful message for Christmas Eve. Love was born in the manger in Bethlehem. But let's talk about that. What kind of love was there? Well, there are several types. First of all, love for one another. Love for one another was born there. That's why so many of us gather uh, together. I mean, we're weary from shopping this time of year. We're trying to to find just that perfect gift, right? You know, guess what? Stores are closed tonight. You can finally rest, right? You can't do it anymore. But up to this point, haven't you been trying to just find that perfect thing for somebody? Somebody that's maybe close to you? There's a cartoon not too long ago picturing three little boys coming to the manger scene bearing gifts. The first two boys brought traditional gifts representing gold and frankincense. The third boy, however, came to the baby Jesus with a really large bag of disposable diapers. Now, Mary could only have wished, but somehow, though, in in that cartoon captured love, but love made practical. Christians in this time of year, when we try to say to our family and our friends how much they mean to us, a gift may not be the best way. And certainly gifts are given with many motivations in mind, but for many of us, there is no more joy in giving than there is in receiving. We need this opportunity to express our feelings, to give of ourselves in concrete ways. Hopefully, though, our love is not a narrow and exclusive thing. Christmas usually causes us to be more thoughtful about the needs of people around us. I was uh, at Target. uh, Was it Target? No, it was Walmart yesterday because I shop at all the high places. I was at Walmart, and there was a police officer there in uniform. And I thought, well, I don't usually see him shopping. I'm glad he can get his shopping done. But there were a couple of police cars in the parking lot, and there were several police officers there. And then I realized they had children with them. And you know what they were doing, right? Picking out presents, letting the children buy presents. And I don't know who paid for it, but I hope we did. I mean, what a wonderful thing to to, to express to people that you, you matter, you're important. That's the kind of love that I'm talking about. There was a baby left on the doorstep many, many years ago at a house in Georgetown, Pennsylvania. The widow living in that house was the head of the house. She was taking care of several other children as well. But she took that baby in, and she loved that baby as her own. And in the evenings, she would read great books to the children. And one of them 
at least, developed a great taste for literature. And that baby that was abandoned was one of America's most prolific authors, James Michener. But James Mitchell's life, you see, was a triumph. Why? Because of the unselfish love of that widowed mother. That is the kind of love that we celebrate. We celebrate that tonight, love for one another, love for those less fortunate. But we also celebrate the kind of love, love for the Christ child himself. It is so easy to forget that. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about the Krosniks. And unlike, well, all my stories are absolutely true. <laughs> she knows. This one's true. The Krosniks were professors at uh, Jackson University. Wonderful people, wonderful musicians, just outstanding. Uh, the, uh, the violin player, uh, Krosnick, his brother was a cellist with the Juilliard String Quartet. So this, these, are, these are heavy players. They know what they're doing. Anyway, they had a baby. And I, I was actually in school with him. He was my age by the time this happened. But the story going around the college was that, you know, we're kind of surprised that he made it. <laughs> we're like, why? He said, well, see, the Krosniks, they're, they're artistic types, you know, the kinds that seem to be like they're always, everything's popping all the time, you know, and they're always creating, always doing things. Like I said, the world-class musicians, there's amazing things going on. They would go to the local Skaggs Albertsons, which was, you know, brand new at that time, and, and then they would shop, and then they would leave. And the store had them on their speed dial to come back and get their baby. <laughs> it happened a half a dozen times where they got home and they'd forgotten their baby in the, in the shopping cart. I mean, we all thought this was really something, but don't we do that in some ways with the Christ child? That it, all of this hoopla that goes on, I mean, Deborah and I, we, we, we enjoy watching holiday specials and Love Actually and all those other romantic things and all. We love all that kind of stuff. It's great. But nothing talks about Jesus. I mean, none of the songs hardly, it's, it's difficult to hear it. It's almost like we're trying to forget that this was about a baby. We can forget the baby too if we are not careful. It is easy this time of year. Brennan Manning tells a beautiful story that recounted every Christmas in the forest of southern France that he ever experienced. And the story was about four shepherds who came to Bethlehem to see the child. And according to the story, one of the shepherds brought eggs. Another brought bread and cheese. The third brought wine. And the fourth brought nothing at all. People call him Le Chant. The first three shepherds sat down with Mary and Joseph. They commented on how well Mary looked and how cozy the cave was, how handsomely Joseph had decorated it, and what a beautiful uh, night it was with all the beautiful stars. They congratulated the, pr the proud parents. They gave them these gifts and assured them that if they need anything at all, please let us know and we'll help you out. And finally, someone peeked through the blanket, hung against the draft in the cr to look at the crash. And sitting or kneeling there at the crib was, was Lachon. The eternal one is how that is um, uh, translated. And through the entire night, he stayed there in adoration, whispering, Yezu, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's, that's where you and I would be, wouldn't it? Kneeling beside the crib, whispering, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. After all, what else can we offer him? He already reigns over all of creation. What can we bring? Only our love and our adoration. And we do that, and we offer that to the Christ that we love. But the most important thing in this world at Christmas time is not our love for one another, nor even our love for Christ. The most important thing in this world is God's love for us, exemplified by the baby Jesus. In Edinburgh, Scotland, there is a place called the Museum of Childhood. It's filled with childhood treasures, teddy bears and puppets and rocking chairs and horses, all model trains and books and games and dollhouses and cases and cases and cases and rooms of dolls. Baby dolls, porcelain dolls, costumed dolls, walking, talking dolls, dolls that can turn somersaults, uh, somersaults expensive dolls, do dolls obviously for privileged children. But off in one corner is a different doll. Behind the glass pane, uh, there is a doll sitting there, and it is an old raggedy doll, much the worst for wear. But then it began its life raggedy. 
On the case, it says, this doll loved and beloved was it belonged to a small girl, a young girl in London, 1905, in the slums. The doll is unnamed, the child is unnamed, and the doll's body is made of tattered brown socks stuffed with rags. Its arms are two thin sticks of wood covered in wool. Its hair is a sock. It wears a plain gingham dress and a rough linen apron. For all of its simplicity, though, it was made with painstaking effort. The head is the heel of a man's shoe, only that. A worn down, battered heel with the nail heads still visible around the edges. For a face, it has a small bit of paper peeled on, paper eyes, paper nose, paper mouth, and the mouth does not smile. Some might call it ugly. That would be wrong, very wrong. It is possible that the slum child made it for herself. Perhaps it was a gift created by a mother or a father who was poor in possessions. All they could give was love. One does not need to have wealth to create something valuable. One need only reach deep within where value is defined. One need not have wealth to give a gift. One need only to have the desire to give, to use whatever poor things we have at hand and to make of them the best gift possible. In all the Western world, there were no slums bleaker than those of London of 1905. But somewhere in those slums, a sad and sorry doll was born. A doll that can bring tears to your eyes because it is so pitiful and because it's so very, very beautiful. If you cannot appreciate the story of a raggedy doll, it will be a challenge for you to appreciate the story of Christmas. A diamond wrapped in a plain cardboard box, the Christ child, a pitiful doll loved into beauty, the Christ child. But you see, we are that doll. I mean, look at us. Who are we that God should love us so? Who are we? There is nothing to recommend us Nothing but God's love and that love that came down to us at Christmas. And the world might cynically imagine that the lost things, the, the, the last thing that we need is another baby. But that baby has been brought into the world and brought love with him. And to celebrate that love on this Christmas Eve, that love for one another, that love for Christ, and most of all, the source of that love, God's love for you and me. Let us pray. Our Father, we are aware that we have done much to this celebration, some of which may seem silly in your eyes, but some of it just means so much to us the gathering of family and friends that is a reflection of our love for them, the concern for those who do without, which is our concern and our love for others. So many things woven together, and yet we do this knowing that you gave us the greatest love, that love that has touched us and changed us. Open our eyes today. Let your story be retold as carols are sung, as we hail the time appointed and declare that your reign on earth has begun. Tell us, tell us of the great love for us as we express to you our great love for you. Amen. We're going to uh, stand and sing Silent Night it's, um, we're going to save the last verse where we'll lift our candles up. Now, we're trying these this year because they're, they're very clean and we're trying to stay clean, but I will tell you I broke two of them trying to get them to work. Uh, apparently, all you have to do is twist the bottom, okay? All right, I know, I know. Don't twist the top, that doesn't work, I promise you. And we'll hold these up when we sing the last verse after we, we have our...
prayer uh, of dedication. Okay? Let's all stand together now. Christmas, everybody. I pray that uh, tonight and tomorrow are some of the greatest experiences that you will ever have in your life. It's, it's, it's possible. There's so much possible because of Jesus Christ in your life. And so we celebrate that tonight and we celebrate that every day as Christ is born every single day of our lives. So uh, celebrate that. Um, now with these candles, I, th I don't know if you can take them home with you or if you want to leave them here or what we're supposed to do with them. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I just might take it home. I, I don't know. <laughs> Find something to do with it. But yeah. Anyway, from from just leave it in the pew. Be just fine. 
Deborah and I want to express to you how much we love you and how much we love being here in New Smyrna Beach. To, to be your pastor and, and family is, um, is a tremendous privilege, and we celebrate that uh, to, together. Even though it's been a big challenging year, hasn't it? A little bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But, uh, but God has been good in, in every way, and so let's, let us celebrate that. Now, uh, receive the benediction of our Lord Jesus Christ as he goes before you and follows after you and leads you along the way until at last we are all safely in his home. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.